and tell everybody, first of all, welcome. My name is Tammy Wallace. I am a co-founder and the president and CEO of the Greater Houston LGBT Chamber. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I want to welcome everyone this morning for this informative webinar. Um, just, just a couple of quick comments about you know, the webinar and this, and this stimulus bill. There's a lot to understand. Um, it's complex, and that is why we are so glad to have Tim here to talk this morning about what you know, he knows at this point and how we can look forward in terms of planning and next steps. So I think you will definitely, definitely find this not only informative, but Tim is the expert. So we are thrilled to have him. Um, there will be opportunities to ask questions at the end of the webinar. So feel free to add any questions during the presentation to the chat box. Uh, Maureen and Christy and I will be monitoring the chat box and make sure that um, Tim gets those gets those questions. And uh, just a quick note, if you're not on mute, please mute yourself and um, let me get uh, Tim up. Let me give you a quick introduction and then let's let him have the bulk of the time here so we can make sure uh, we can get all the questions, all the information out today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Tim Jeffcoat. He is the director of the U.S. Small Business Administration in Houston. He oversees SBA programs and services in Houston and the surrounding 32 counties of Texas. Most of his career has been private sector leadership roles in international business, marketing, and business development. And his career has required international assignments and global responsibilities. He's a graduate of Auburn University with a Master's of Business, Master of Business Administration degree. And he has a BS degree in marketing and a BS in music business. So uh, Tim has been an invaluable, invaluable partner for us. I think uh, if you don't know on the call, for those joining us for the call today, the SBA has been a strategic partner of our chamber since we launched in 2016. Their support, their resources, their help for the LGBTQ and allied business community is tremendous. They're one of the best in the nation and that is through Tim's leadership. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to you, Tim, is we had Tim recently fill out a, a blog post for us. We asked him, asked him some, some great questions. It was we were getting ready to uh, uh, renew our strategic alliance memorandum with the Houston District Office. And I love this quote that he shared. It's a, he said, success should not be dependent on who we are, who we love, or how we worship. Every single American has a chance to achieve the American dream of owning their own business. We want to help them achieve it. And I know Tim wants to help today, make sure that you understand this second round of PPP. And we are so glad to have you, Tim. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Hello, everyone. Let me get my screen up here. Just take a second. Very good. So you should see a big old fat SBA logo. Yeah. So Here's what we're gonna talk about. Um, what I wanna do is summarize for you what this no, most recent Economic Relief Act is going to bring out for small businesses. Um, just focus through that page. I'm gonna go over some new things and some change things with the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, a new thing called Shuttered Venue Grants, and then two changes, one on debt relief and one on our lending programs for our existing things that we do for helping small businesses with the money that they need. And then we'll make some recommendations on how you can move forward uh, at the end. But first, if you have not done this, please do so. Go to my website here in Houston, bottom right-hand corner, you can sign up for our updates. That way, Anytime we do anything, we will be sending information to you so you know. We're not going to spam you, uh, you know, sell your email address to someone. But if you go look there, sign up for our emails. As soon as you have enough detail to offer a webinar, we will do it. And we're doing between 15 and 30 webinars a week right now. So uh, that's a great way for you to stay in touch. An hour of your time, 30 minutes of your time, and you don't have to leave home. So that you know I'm not making any of this up, this is coming directly from either the Economic Aid Act, and you can see the specific section. That act is 2,200 pages long. And no, I did not read all of it. I only have read about the 60 or so pages that relate to the SBA. 
There are a, variance, a variety of what we call guidances that have been released, or they're also called interim final rules. So those are rules by the SBA that put the act into motion. And then there's a couple of updated forms for applying. So this is what we refer to when I'm going through here. Um, first thing that I think that you wanna know, $284.45 billion is what is in this act for supporting small business. And that's, that's fine, but what's really noteworthy here in the green, you see there's $15 billion set aside only for community development, financial institutions and minority deposit institutions. There aren't very many of them in the Houston area, but their clients really need some help. And so this money is set aside for them to administer. Then uh, the next item in green, there's $35 billion for first time borrowers with 15 billion of that set aside for the smallest with fewer than 10 employees or loans under $250,000 in low income areas. Then there's 25 billion for uh, what's called the second draw loan program and with the same kind of parameters. And I'll tell you more about second draw. So that's good news that there's money being specifically set aside in order to help uh, the worst hit in the small businesses. There's 20 billion um, put back into that EIDL grant program. If you ever heard about that in the past, it's also called an EIDL advance. And then there's 15 billion set aside for grants for live venues. So I'll go into more detail on all of this. But the important point for you here is that it's not just one chunk of money going out, however it gets done. There are specific pieces carved out to make sure those smaller and harder hit get hurt. So let's talk about Paycheck Protection Program. Um, in the Paycheck Protection Program, just to do a quick review, this is a loan for paychecks. It is intended that all of it, but it, as little as 60% of it, is used for paychecks for your employees. Now this is W-2 employees, not 1099s. 1099s are considered by the SBA and by the Internal Revenue Service to be independent contractors, and they can apply for their own PPP. But for those W-2 employees, that's what this is meant for. Once again, it's 60% or more has to be spent on paychecks. So this is a very narrow purpose loan just for paychecks. Now the other 40%, if you don't use it for paychecks, you may use it for other categories of expenses, but there's not many. Again, this is a very narrowly defined loan. Uh, it's for mortgage interest, mortgage interest, those words go together, rent and utilities. And I'll just, I'm about to show you that it has been opened up to a few new categories, but don't get too excited because it's still to get the forgiveness that you want. These loans are 100% forgivable. Then it's gotta be 40% or less on these categories. So up to $10 million, 60% has to be spent on paychecks, 40% or less on other categories. You get this from the banker you work with now. If, you, if your banker doesn't offer this, just go hit that website that I gave you earlier. We have a list there of the lenders in the area that are actively doing PPP loans and you just pick the one you like. Um, to get 100% forgiveness, you also need to make sure that you are paying your employees 75% or more of what you have been paying them, what you're paying them last year, either in hours or in wages. So those are, that's the main characteristics of PPP. One more thing, well, how, how do you calculate the of a PPP? The amount of the PPP is based on your average monthly payroll. So you'll look back over the previous year, you will calculate what your average monthly payroll was. Let's say it was $100,000. You're gonna multiply that by 2.5. So now your loan amount will be $250,000. It's that simple. So let's get into the changes. So this thing called section four that you see on the screen, those are the main changes for the eligible expense. There are now some operating expenses and pay for with these loans, specifically software, cloud computing, 
human resources and accounting. I, I hope this doesn't apply to anybody here, but the next part in green is if there are damages to your business due to public disturbances that is not reimbursed by your insurance, then you may repair your building using this PPP money. Supplier costs, this is also still very narrow. If you had a purchase order or contract in place at, uh, prior to taking out the loan, then you may use this to pay for those uh, supplier costs if that, those uh, supplies are essential to the operation of your business. And then the final category is worker protective equipment. You may spend PPP money for masks and gloves and that kind of thing, but this is actually broader. You can use this uh, in plexiglass barriers and some other tech devices to be able to protect your employees. Um, we'll have greater detail on that soon on how many things might be covered by that. And then the very bottom of the screen in green, section six, it says uh, previously you had to either choose that you would spend this money over an eight week period or a 24 week period. You may now choose between eight and 24 weeks. So if 16 weeks is the magical number, then you may certainly spend it over 16 weeks. Your group insurance uh, for your employees, assuming you use group uh, benefits, that is part of payroll costs, so include that. And business had to have been in existence prior to February 15. We receive calls all the time from people that opened their business in June or July of last year, and unfortunately, they are not eligible. You are only eligible if your business existed prior to February 15. And then section 12 at the bottom, I'll paraphrase for you what that means. Um, if you or any business you know of applied for a PPP back in the early days of COVID and they got approved for a loan, let's say they got approved for a million dollars and they decided they didn't want it after all, or they decided they only wanted, let's say $100,000 of it. You may now go back to that lender and tell them, you know what, I've changed my mind and I would like to get the full balance of the loan. And uh, there will be rules that we will give the lenders so they can make that happen for you. So that's really good news. And this might be interesting for you, Tammy. Um, 501c6 organizations, nonprofit organizations are now eligible for these PPP loans. Usually that's going to be a chamber of commerce. Also, it's what we call destination marketing organizations. So these are uh, basically uh, convention and visitor bureau kind of organizations. So there's some really important stipulations. You can't receive more than 15% of your income from lobbying, and you can't spend more than 50% your equities on lobbying, and the cost of lobbying can't exceed more than a million dollars. And Tammy, I'm sorry, but you have to have under 300 employees. So I, I, I think we're there. I think so. I think you're okay. All right. All right. So that's really good news. That's some very important organizations to all of us that were left out of the first round of PPP. And then section 42 says publicly traded companies are ineligible. So they were the first time around and probably you've all heard in the news about some publicly traded company, maybe a restaurant uh, that was getting PPP loans. Well, that has now changed so that they are no longer eligible at all. And then finally, news organizations, so television stations, newspapers, and radio uh, stations, um, and many, many of them are now eligible for this, and they were left out previously. So that's what we now call draw PPP. I'll do a fast recap. Those loans are up to $10 million. They 60% or more must be used for paychecks. 40% or less can be used for those other expenses over. Um, they are 100% forgivable. You do them with your local bank. If you don't have one, you can contact our office and we can send you a list or you can just download it from our website. They are 100% forgivable. Um, to get the forgiveness, you have to spend the 60-40 way that I explained, and then you can't pay your employees less 
you, you can't cut their pay or hours more than 25%. So those are the key factors for getting 100% forgiveness. And the amount is calculated as 2.5 times your average monthly payroll. And that's over the, the previous year. So now we have this new thing called second draw PPP. So if you received a PPP and you now need additional funding for your business, or if you know a business that you know received PPP and you think they might need additional funding, this is a great way to do it. Still 100% forgivable. It's a maximum of $2 million. So PPP is 10 million. The second draw is 2 million. And to 300 employees, if you that and you're ineligible, you have used or will use the full amount of PPP. So um, you do not have to have applied for forgiveness. You do not have to have received forgiveness for your first PPP in order to apply for this. The number here in green is really important. You must demonstrate at least a 20% reduction in gross receipts comparing quarter to quarter between 2019 and 2020. So gross receipts, I get a lot of questions. What does that mean? Well, for most small businesses, that's just sales, whatever your sales are. But let's say, uh, you know, Tim's business is in a strip shopping center and I own the strip shopping center. So my gross receipts would be the sales in my store and that shopping center, plus all of the income that I receive from rent for my tenants. So gross receipts is different than sales. It's all of the income for your, your business. So if you can do that 25% or more reduction, then you, you are eligible as long as you meet these other factors. There are people yeah. that can't do that. They don't have an accounting system, so they can't say what their gross receipts were for quarter one 2019 compared to quarter one 2020. I'm going to tell you, I'll get the end, I'll give you recommendations. You need to go work with one of our, our resource partners and let them help you do that. Because at the moment, it specifically states you have to show on this quarter to quarter basis. So it can be any quarter. It could be quarter one to quarter one, quarter two to quarter two, any of those. And if you were in business all year, you can compare 2019 to 2020. So you could compare year to year. You Tim, can see there in the... Yes, go ahead. Tim, I, I just wanted to, before you move off this point, we did had a couple of questions come through. One, can you define payroll? Uh, what's the definition of that? Uh, <clears throat> that is spelled out on the PPP application in the instructions. It's, it delineates what payroll is. But payroll is generally, uh, we have some other webinars we do where we break that out in detail. And I don't have it at, at my fingertips, but it's basically going to be whatever you are doing in terms of compensation for your employees. So for me, you might pay me an hourly wage. You might pay me a quarterly bonus because I do a wonderful job. You might pay me a housing allowance. And because I have horrible clothes, you might pay me a clothing allowance. All of that is compensation. On top of that, you might provide me with kind of benefits, health insurance, whatever it may be. You may even reimburse tuition. All of that is compensation. So anything you are doing for your employees that can be classified as compensation. So that would be your payroll. Now, <clears throat> the question comes, what about federal taxes? Well, federal taxes are not payroll. But any taxes you pay on your payroll are part of payroll. So here in the state of Texas, you are taxed on the payroll that you pay your employees in some cases. So that can be included in your calculation. But essentially, if you've got 10 employees, you pay them all $100,000 a year, their gross salary, that's a million dollars. If you pay a half a million dollars in benefits, then that makes your payroll 1.5 million. And if you have another $200,000 worth of other various compensation like bonuses, then that means you've got a 1.7 million payroll. Divide that by 12 and now your average monthly payroll. Mike, does that cover, because he had a series of questions. I want to make sure before we move. Uh, yes, that's perfect for the payroll definition. Thank you. And then the other question was about how to define the quarters, if it's calendar quarter only or if it's any three month period. No, at the moment, all that I know is that it's going to be calendar quarter only. 
And I know that there are people whose years are defined in such a way that they, their quarter might be, you know, December, January, February. At the moment that I know of, there is no provision for that. If it were me personally, and I'm not giving anyone advice, but if Tim Jeff Coates' company knew I wanted to go after this, I would be busy right now restating my income in calendar quarter so that I could demonstrate the way the government's asking. Um, so these IFRs that I mentioned earlier, interim final rules, those are the rules on how to engage on doing second draw PPP have not been issued. I believe they will be issued over the weekend. I'm not doing this for anybody's sympathy, but we really do have people sleeping in their offices and working through the night and, and you know, not going home and all that kind of thing in order to get these done. So I do publish this weekend. By next week, I think we will know more on that. I suspect by Tuesday morning, and I don't say Monday because Monday is a federal holiday, by Tuesday morning, we will have that guidance. And if there is a deviation, if it allows you to define your three month period or what have you, that'll be great. And we will be pushing that out in our PPP webinars. But at the moment, it looks like it is clearly calendar quarter. So quarter one would be January, February, March. Tim, if the if the business was uh, operational uh, all of 2019, uh, the question is, can we compare all of 2019 to all of 2020? Uh, yeah, what I read so far at this point in time is that you can compare. Wait, I think I put something. Oh, I put something new in here. Okay, I all forgot. Right. That I put a new slide in right before we started, just so we could talk about. Okay. It. But yes, it is my understanding you if you were in business the entire times of all of 2019 and all of 2020, that you will be able to compare year to year. With the caveat, just like it says at the bottom of the screen, um, we don't have the interim final rule yet. As soon as we do, it will be clarified and it will be known, but I believe you will be able to do that. So it's probably probably smart that we just go ahead and look at this. Um, the, this is what the act itself says, so I bear with me, this is not easy to read. Uh, I did my best to highlight what I thought was really relevant. If you had gross receipts during the first, second, or third quarter, or only if you're applying after January 1st and you are, 2021, fourth quarter of 2020, then you need to demonstrate not less than a 25% reduction in gross receipts during the same quarter of 2019. That's exactly what we've already described. Um, and then section BB, if you weren't in business and CC and DD, basically say if you weren't in business those whole periods, then you're going to compare whichever quarters you were in business. So if you're only in business in quarter four of 2019, then you'll compare that to quarter four of 2020. And this is the, that I know of, this is the entire universe of knowledge on this at this point in time. <clears throat> but by next Tuesday, I do believe we will have a much cleaner definition. And the people working on this are really smart people. They will probably miss something because they're just human, but they will undoubtedly make it as flexible and as meaningful as they can. You know, and it doesn't even matter here, but I'll editorialize for just a brief moment. There is a horrendous number of people falsifying or otherwise taking advantage of the PPP program just to get some free money. And um, those folks are who we unfortunately have to think about when we define how to get a second round PPP. The intent, as it is shown here, is those folks that are really getting hurt. That if you were doing a million in revenue last year and you've been knocked down to 50,000 or 700,000 this year, that hurts. So we wanna help you. If you didn't get knocked down like that, you don't need this help. It might hurt right now, but the other guy hurts way worse. And that's the point here. And uh, so when we issue the guides, we try to take all of that into account. You want me to go forward, Tammy? Yes, it looks like the question's been answered, so. I'll okay. Go. Okay, and I'll address that more as we go through. So here we go. We talked about the 2.5 times your uh, monthly payroll, average monthly payroll, unless you are a hotel or food service, then you can do 
3.5 times your average monthly payroll. Now, let me stop there for a second. This is really important because it's not just hotels and food service. It's anyone with a NAICS code of 72. So the North American Industrial Education System codes are six digits long. And we've moved it all the way back to what's called the group code. So anyone that fits in NAICS 72 will be able to do that. And if you don't know if you fit, but you're somewhere kind of like a restaurant or a hotel, then go to www.nakes.com and read about uh, NAICS code 72. And if you fit, excellent. Then you will be able to do a second draw with 3.5 times payroll to a two million. Uh, no more than 300 employees. I think we already said that. You can only do one of these second draws. The 60-40 still applies. And the lender that you did your first draw PPP with can, doesn't mean they will, but they can do your second draw. So let me talk about that for a second. Every lender that was working doing PPP last year may not choose to continue doing it. So you may not be able to do it with who you did your first draw with. Also, if you did your first draw with someone and you're not particularly happy with it for whatever reason, then once again, go to my website here in Houston, uh, and I'll give it to you again before we get to the end of this. And we have a list there of lenders in this area with offices in this area that have been doing PPP. It doesn't guarantee they will do more PPP, but, it, but they should be. Um, so that's all really important stuff to know. Whoops. And uh, eh, nothing particularly relevant here other than um, this presentation is already getting dated and I'm gonna have to update it. And the green basically says, never mind what the words say there, I'll tell you what it means. Everything that has been documented so far on how to receive forgiveness still applies. Really what that says. Okay, so that actually takes us to forgiveness. I'll do a quick fast recap. You know what a first draw PPP is. We talked a lot about that. A second draw PPP, if you have received a first draw, you don't have to be finished spending it. You don't have to be, fin be uh, you don't have to have submitted for forgiveness and you don't have to have received forgiveness in order to pursue a second draw. For second draw, the most important thing is you've got to exhibit that 25% or more reduction in revenues on a quarter to quarter basis, any quarter. You could have been up in quarter one and quarter two and down in quarter three, great. If it's down more than 25, you should be good. Keeping in mind, we have to wait for the interim final ruling, but based on everything we read, what I just told you is true. I think I said maximum of 2 million and, uh, and that's that. So now when you look at forgiveness, I think one of the most important things you wanna know and you wanna share with everyone you know that has a PPP, you have 10, one zero, 10 months from the end of your covered period before you apply for forgiveness. There's a lot of misconception that you have to do it as soon as you get done finish, finishing, as soon as you get done spending the money. Or that if your bank sends you an email saying, okay, we're inviting you to come apply forgiveness, it doesn't mean you have to. You have 10 months from the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. Now, why am I bringing that up? In my case, um, I'd like to do as fast as possible because I just don't want to have to worry about it. I want to know that it's forgiven and I don't have to deal with it in the future. However, as I'm about to talk to you about, we are still changing up some of the aspects of forgiveness based on the request of Congress. And it's going to make it even easier for about 85% of all PPP borrowers. So if you wanted to hurry up and get it done today or tomorrow, I would tell you don't. I would tell you, wait until about mid-February before you even think about forgiveness because there's going to be some new provisions. So let's talk about those now that I've given you the teaser. So there will be a simplified application. Um, it says we have 24 days to get this done. That's 24 days from the time the act was signed. And that's roughly the last week of this month. Um, so that simplified application is supposed to be no more than one page long, and it's for loans up to $150,000, which as I said, is about 85% of all borrowers. 
Um, it is meant to make the application process simple. Um, you, the borrower, are assuming all liability for having spent the loan properly. The bank has no liability for the way you spent the money. Um, a form like this exists right now. It's called the 3508S short form, and it is only for up to 50000 So I can't tell you that they're just going to take that form and put a one in front of the five on 50000 and now say it applies to one hundred fifty. I don't know what's going to happen. But it will be a simplified, easier version to apply for forgiveness. In your specific case, if you have a lot of employees, let's say you've got you know, 75 employees um, and you work some part time, some full time, some are salaried, some are not, yeah, the odds are pretty good. You wouldn't want to use that. Um, the odds are and with that many employees, there's so many variables that you may want to use the full-blown forgiveness process, which is much more detailed, but that doesn't make it harder. What it does is it gives you more opportunity to get maximum forgiveness. So if you are somebody that will be looking at forgiveness uh, in the very near future, you want to go to our forgiveness webinars. Winston LeBay of my team teaches those, and Winston is top-notch. He knows everything there is to know about PPP forgiveness. Well, everything he can know. There's probably more he could know, but uh, anyway, he's really knowledgeable. Tim, yes, Tim we, have a we have a question. Uh, my bank hasn't opened the applications for forgiveness yet. If we received a second draw PPP, does this extend our forgiveness past the date of the second draw, or would it still apply to the date of the first PPP? Now, the way I understand it, is your first draw PPP, you're gonna have 10 months from the end of your covered period and nothing changes that. After your second draw PPP, you should be able to get 10 months from the end of that covered period. Now, we don't know that for sure yet. We gotta get that internal in, uh, interim final ruling and it may be limited. It may be you get four months after the end of your second draw PPP. So we don't know that answer yet, but that we, are, that we know nothing is gonna change on your first draw when you can apply for forgiveness. Now, there are a lot of banks, particularly the larger banks. I'm gonna guess you probably have a national bank like Wells Fargo or JP Morgan Chase or one of those. But a lot of the larger banks are trying to do forgiveness in waves. So they will send out invitations to apply for forgiveness. That doesn't mean you have to do it, but it does mean that until they send it to you, they're not gonna accept your application for forgiveness. That causes a lot of stress and anxiety for some people, but it shouldn't. Don't worry about it. You have 10 months until the end of your covered period. All they're trying to do is manage the flow of work through their bank so that it is more streamlined and more efficient. Okay, we're good there. Thank you. Okay, so that's all we know about this new forgiveness. I think it's worth waiting for. If you have a loan, 150000 or less, absolutely. You want to wait for this? Maybe you'll find out, eh, this is not any good. It doesn't work help for me. But for every, I bet there's 10 others that say, oh gosh, this is perfect and I'm going to get 100% forgiveness. So, four. Um, section 33 here at the bottom of the page. This is super important if you got an EIDL grant. If you received one of those EIDL grants, also called advances, then the CARES Act required us to, re, to deduct that from your forgiveness. Now that's repealed, so it will not be deducted from your forgiveness. And if you already applied for forgiveness and it was deducted from your forgiveness, then we will now be sending that money back to your bank to pay off your loan and make sure that you're in good shape. So that's really good news. Speaking of economic injury disaster loans, so I'll give you some updates on those, but a quick overview of EIDL. For COVID, those are loans from the United States government. They are not grants. They are not forgivable. Up to $150,000, 25 year terms at a low interest rate, which is 3.75% interest. Uh, these are fairly versatile loans. Remember when I talked about Paycheck Protection Program, those loans are very narrow in their purpose. EIDL loans can be used for most operating expenses. The intent 
is that first you have to be injured by the economy. So it just it isn't just a good loan to go get. You must be injured by the economy. And then um, the purpose of the money is to keep your doors open during the injury. It isn't so you can buy new stoves or new trucks or, or any new equipment or buy a new building or buy a competitor. It is only meant to help keep your doors open in the true context of a disaster to help you cope with the disaster. That's it. So there are limits on its use, but it, it will probably, as I just described, be useful for keeping your doors open as long as $150,000 is going to be enough. Now, if you're somebody who says, you know, Tim, I need a half a million dollars. Well, you're not going to get it with EIDL. And if you really need that, then we probably should look at some other alternatives for you to get that kind of funding. So let me tell you what we have going on with EIDL. Bottom of the screen, let's look at that first. The loan period has been extended. It expired December 31 of 2020. It's been renewed through December 31 of 2021. So all of this calendar year. But really important note, just because the, the technicality here is that the SBA has declared the disaster to last until December 31, 2021. That doesn't mean the funding from Congress will last that long. So if you think this is a, a, an alternative for your business, then I would encourage you to go ahead and apply for it. It's low interest rate. Let's say you apply for it, you get $100,000 and you're not really sure you're gonna need it, but you have been economically injured. Just stick it in the bank, run your business, do a good job running your business. If you need some, use it. If you don't, just hang on to it. And a year from now, we've all been vaccinated and you go, yeah, I didn't need that 100,000 after all, pay it back. All it's gonna cost you in the meantime is 3.75% on that one year. And then just pay it back. You can pay it back anytime you want and there are no penalties for doing that. So this is, this is an outstanding product. So that's the loan available through the end of the year as long as funding persists. Now, we also have a grant affiliated with this program. Here's what you wanna know. The grants last year, the money ran out. Those grants were supposed to be $10,000 per business that applied. The, we changed that last year, the SBA changed that to be $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. So now what we're doing, we've gotten more funding from Congress for these grants, and we're specifically going to target the existing applicants, no new applicants that are in low income communities. So if you applied for the grant and you are in a low income community and you didn't receive any grant money because we ran out of funds, then we will now be contacting you and inviting you to come get your money. If you are in a low income area and you did receive the grant, but you only got, let's say $3,000 because you only have three employees, then you will now be invited to come get the remaining $7,000. There is no that I am aware of and that I have been told, there is no provision for opening this to new applications at all. And the belief is that all this money will be consumed this way. If not, then there could be a time in the next few months that we say, okay, we're gonna open this up to more people. So other people can now apply and maybe there'll be some criteria like low income community but it doesn't feel like that will be likely because there's just not that much money in this program. And this is what a low income community is. And I'm sorry for all the weird language, but this is government ease. And this is straight from the Internal Revenue Service. It's a census tract. So the census cuts the US into tracts. It's a census tract with a poverty rate of at least 20% or the median family income doesn't exceed 80% of the statewide family income, or which would be the case with most of us, in a metro area, the family income doesn't exceed 80% of the greater of either the statewide or the metro family income. So there you go. Um, that still probably doesn't help most people because they go, well, I don't know what the income is in my track. There are databases online, and I believe they are with, with census, where you can look this stuff up. 
but I haven't seen those databases and I personally don't know where to tell you to go. But if you think you're in a low income tract and you applied before, then you may be getting an email from the SBA to uh, invite you to come get your $10,000 or your, the remaining balance on your initial grant. So that's what's going on with economic injury disaster loans. I know that's been a lot already. You're probably sick and tired of hearing me talk already. But this is really cool, the shuttered venue grants. This is new to the world before I show it to you. This is brand new to the world. So we're having to invent this program. It has never been in existence before. Um, you can't, uh, this is no guarantee. You, this is simply my opinion. This will probably come out the first week in February. It might be the last week in, July, in uh, January, but there's a lot to do and this is a big program. So I think it'll probably be first week in February. And here's what it means. If you are a live venue operator, and I know that's a very broad phrase, a live venue operator or promoter, theatrical producer, live performing arts organization operator, museum, movie theater, or talent representative who can demonstrate a 25% or greater reduction in revenue, then this grant could be for you. If there's 15, one five, $15 billion in the program, which in my opinion will go pretty quickly. Two billion is set aside only for the really small venues like this with fewer than 50 employees, full-time employees. The grant is up to $10 million. And I'm sure the 10 million is gonna be based on your revenues and size and all that. So uh, don't get too excited. And if you spend that first grant and you still need more funding, you may get a second grant up to 50% of the first grant. Once this comes online, and again, my guess is February 1st, then the first two weeks, the first 14 days, the only entities able to apply are those with 90% or greater revenue loss. So clearly the hardest hit, that's is the ones that are just devastated. After those two weeks, the next two weeks are only for those with 70% or greater revenue loss. So if you are one of these entities and you had a 50% loss in revenue, you're gonna to have to wait 28 days before you can apply. Now the costs are, again, kind of like with the EIDL uh, loan that I talked about. Those, the, the, the EIDL loan is meant to keep your door open, not to do anything new, not to do any improvements. This is essentially gonna be the same. The idea is to pay payroll, rent, utilities, PPE for the staff, and then the basic operating supplies to keep the business running, not for anything new. And that next to the last bullet that's in green, that's kind of important because Congress is requiring the administrators, that's my boss, the lady that runs the Small Business Administration, to conduct increased oversight of persons receiving these grants. So anytime my office grants money to an organization, and there are four organizations here in Houston that we grant money to, we have oversight over those organizations. And we do go to them on a periodic basis and make sure the money is being spent correctly. If it's not, that's a problem. So that may occur with these entities. Yeah, so we that's have a, everything we, have a, we know about the shuttered venue grants. And Ms. we do have a question on the shuttered venue grants. Uh, Question is, you don't have to actually be completely shuttered to qualify for a shuttered venue grant, right. correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. That's correct. Yeah, in other words, and I, now I'm kind of interpreting here, and that's smart to do because we don't have the final rules on this, but it says the grants are eligible if you can demonstrate 25% reduction or more. So anyone that fits those that description in yellow that can show a 25% or more reduction in revenue is eligible. Now there's another really important distinction and it's not on this page and I wonder why, because it is on other pages. Um, if you receive, if you apply for and receive this grant, you are ineligible to apply for a PPP. So Congress is not allowing you to have both. 
It's one or the other. There are cases where it would make more sense for you to apply for a PPP. If you, let's say you are 26% impaired in your revenue, well, that means you're gonna have to wait a month before you can apply. And in a month, who knows, this 15 billion might be gone. In the meantime, there's 200, $50, $60 billion successful applying for a PPP for your organization. Um, it's up to 10 million if that's a first draw, 2 million if it's a second draw, and it's 100% forgivable, but mainly is intended for paychecks and a very narrow range of operating supplies. So you have to look at all those factors to decide what's going to be smartest for your organization. Now, before anybody asks, I've already been asked, yeah, but what if I apply for a PPP and I get it and then I get the grant? Can I pay back the PPP and get the grant or can, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, that is something I can't do any conjecture on. Uh, we'll have to see what the guidance is on that. Um, Tim, that's it. We, we, have, we have another question. Who that's does good. the live venue owner contact? So you, all of this will be done online. It'll be directly from the SBA. Uh, I can tell you now, you are going to need what's called a SAM account, S-A-M. So if you are interested in that or you, or you have somebody you know will be interested in it today, they should go to www.sam.gov account. It's going to require certain information from you that you might have to go get. And it might take you a few days to get that SAM account. But SAM stands for System for Award Management. And that's <laughs> the computer system the federal government uses to pay and interact with all the people that it gives money to. So if you're not in SAM, you're not going to be able to receive this money. And a, a, another clarifying question, a live venue place that received a PPP last year but has remained shuttered is not allowed to apply for the venue grant? That's not known. That is not known. Um, all I know really is what you see here. So I'll show you one more thing. Let me scroll back. I hope this doesn't give anybody vertigo. Uh, second draw. It says second draw. Entity that receives a grant under the shuttered venue uh, operator grant may not receive a second draw. So, I mean, maybe there is a possibility for a first draw and a grant, but I don't know the answer to that at this time. We're just not going to know until they, this whole program gets fully cooked, and that's going to take at least another week, probably another two weeks. If this is really important to you, if an organization that you think is really going to be relying on this, send me an email. Tammy can get in touch with me. Let me know. And then as I know more, I can't promise I'll get it to you because I have so many things going on and people uh, demanding my time. But I will try to make sure that my office, somebody in my office, make sure you get the information. Um, we will, in my office, we will be holding webinars on shuttered venue grants as soon as we have enough information to hold one. Like Tim, there it goes. Freezing up just a little bit, Tim. There. Ah, the virtual world. Hopefully, he will be back on uh, shortly. Um, I will say what he was saying about the shuttered venue. Uh, uh, webinars. Keep an eye out. We are uh, adding all that information to the chamber calendar as well as uh, sharing that out in the member Facebook group to make sure that everybody knows when those events are occurring. So Maureen, did we uh, did we lose him? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Hopefully, well, hopefully he'll, he'll back be back. back. He'll mm -hmm. be uh, he'll be back on here momentarily. Uh, keep your questions coming. Looks like here I am. Did you miss me? No, we did miss you. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tech, technology. 
Oops, 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 oops. Okay, so I should have a shuttered venue grant slide back up. Yes, you did. Okay. You're good. Where did I where where was I where did I so rudely uh, drop out? <laughs> I I think you were answering uh you were saying that there would be webinars coming up to cover this. Yeah, the only thing of real substance I can tell you now is I'm sure you will need a SAM account. So go ahead and do that. If uh, And if you run into trouble with it, just contact my office and we got folks that can help you. SAM is not our database. So, you know, but we understand how to get an account in there. We understand the basics and we, we, can, we, we may be able to help with that. But it should be really straightforward. You basically just have to, have to identify who you are and prove who you are, and then you have an account. And that allows the government then to transact with you, um, granting or paying bills or whatever it is that we would be doing. Beyond that, there's just very little known other than what's on this page. But as soon as we know more, we will be holding the webinars on this so that we can get as many folks as possible. Because as you know, there are just thousands of organizations like this in the Houston and Tim, I shared when you dropped off that we would be, uh, we'll share out those webinars once they're available. Uh, as you all, your office does a great job of keeping us updated on upcoming right. webinars. Very good. Okay, so just a couple more things, and fairly, fairly quick. If you or anyone you know have an existing SBA loan, not disaster, but an SBA business loan, so what's called a 7A loan, a 504, or an SBA micro loan, then we've got some great news for you. You would have noticed last year that we were making your loan payments for you um, as long as your loan was in what we call good servicing status, which generally means you've been making your payments and if you were behind, it wasn't very much. So now that program is being extended. Beginning February, we will make three more months of payments on your loan capped at $9,000 per borrower per month. And if you are what we are calling underserved, smallest or hardest hit, those are really ambiguous terms, then we may be doing five more months of payments capped at $9,000 per borrower per month. So that's up to eight months worth of payments um, this year. Now, what is a hardest hit sector? Some examples, this is not exclusive, um, our food service, accommodation, arts, entertainment, recreation, education, laundry, and personal care, as well as those industries with sector-wide high rates of job losses. So we'll see how much more defined that gets. We're expecting this also now, but this is, this is really good news. So at least three months, maybe eight months of your loan payments made for you to help you get through this and help your cash flow. Now, uh, now I'm talking to the businesses that are doing okay or any business you know that's doing okay because you need to call that business owner and tell them about this. If they're doing okay, let's say they make plexiglass. So there's a huge demand now for plexiglass barriers. Then if they go get a new SBA loan to build some new plexiglass machines or buy a building or whatever they need it for, then SBA will make payments on their new loans up to six months, also capped at 9,000 a month. And that goes through September of this year, September 30. So they would need to close on that loan fairly soon in the next couple of months to get all six payments. But that is super news. In addition, I'm gonna go ahead and skip over here, there are no fees that's in the middle of the page for those loans. Normally those loans come with some relatively small fees or percentage of the total loan that helps this program perpetuate. Um, there will be no fees, pay six months of your payments. And then uh, believe it or not, this is a really important one. It's that first loan. Ordinarily, when a business goes and gets an SBA loan, we guarantee that loan. That's what it means to be an SBA loan. So we de-risk it to the lender. And ordinarily, that's 75%. So if Tammy went to get a $100,000 loan, then the bank would be obligated, well, and then Tammy couldn't pay it, then, the, then SBA would be obligated to pay 75,000 of that 
on her behalf. Now that's a 90% guarantee. So then the bank's only exposure to doing a loan for Tammy is only $10,000. If she couldn't pay her loan, we'd pay 90,000. The point is it incentivizes the banker to do a loan to you right now. So six months payments, no fees. Right now, the interest rates are at historic lows and a 90% guarantee to the lender to incentivize them to work with you. There are a few more details on here. They're, I think they're really irrelevant for what we're talking about right now, except maybe at the bottom in yellow, 504 refinancing. So a 504 loan is a special one that has uh, a big chunk of it at a fixed interest rate, which right now is very low, for up to 25 years. And if you have some debt in your business and it's just tough to manage, it, it, it inhibits your ability to grow because of the servicing of that debt, but you're basically an okay business, then you can refinance your existing debt, may be able to finance, refinance your existing debt into a 504, lowers your payments, gives you a big chunk of it with a fixed interest rate so that you could now have really radically altered your cash flow each month, especially while you're working on, you know, keeping your business uh, growing and doing well during this tough economic time. So this is a wonderful news, not really directly related to disaster financing, just on our regular SBA funding, but, uh, but really great news if you're in the market to do that kind of thing. And Tammy, this is my last slide. These four folks at the top of the screen are free for you to use. Texas Gulf Coast Small Business Development Center. They've got about 75, 80 people, full-time folks. All they do at no charge is help small businesses. So they, you have a direct person there you work with, you are their client, and they'll help you with uh, a shutter venue grant, they'll help you with a PPP loan, they'll help you with your social media plan, they'll help you with your you know, quarterly tax projections, whatever it is you got going on. So if you are somebody that needs to do this uh, quarterly, quarter to quarter um, analysis for PPP second draw, these folks are in good shape to be able to help you do that. Now they're not gonna do it for you, but they're gonna be able to coach you through it. Houston score, is about 165 volunteers that are a lot like you. They've owned a business, maybe they still do, but they just don't have to go to work anymore. And they volunteer their time to help small businesses. And they have a team of folks there, mostly ex-bankers and ex-CFOs that are specifically working with clients on PPP and EIDL issues. Frequently, women business owners prefer to work with other women on their businesses. So at the WBEA Women's Business Center, that's exactly what you have. Just so you know, they take men as clients, but they are really focused on women entrepreneurs. And we have a new Women's Business Center, but they're not really up and running yet, but maybe next month they're going to be in a position to be able to help. And it's affiliated with the Greater Houston Women's Chamber. I'll point out a couple more things on this screen. You can see all of it for yourself. But the bottom, uh, middle right hand, that's how to get in touch with my office. So later today, you say, you know, there's that question I really did want to ask. You just send it to that email address and we will do our best to take care of you. You can call us. Um, I'm, I can promise you nobody's going to answer that phone. It's always going to go to voicemail. But we check those messages quickly and all the time. Um, on the far left in there is my website. As I said, please go to that website and sign up for our email updates. That way we can stay in touch with you and let you know what we're doing. You can also get a copy of these slides there and a list of the lenders that are working on PPP. Um, and that's that. I think that's everything relevant on this slide, Tammy. Um, any more questions okay. you want us to deal with? Well, I, ju I just wanted to share a great comment from uh, Mike Holloman, uh, one of our founding members. As a broker, I'm glad to serve programs that are, uh, that are expanding and acquiring. Uh, the support for new loans and the associated relief is great news. Thank you. So uh, good. I think so too. In fact, I think that's one of the most exciting things to come out of this this act. Um, we're essentially doing what we were doing before with a few little changes, but man, that's cool stuff. Ninety percent guarantee, no fees, six months payments. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I think, you know, we've done a, tried to track these. Oh, we did have a question. Thank you. Maureen, you want to throw that one out there that came through Facebook? Yes, we did have a question, Tim, um, from our Facebook watchers. Um, if you are a sole proprietor, do you, do you provide your total income instead of your payroll and multiply times 2.5 for the PPP? Uh, yeah, if you're a sole proprietor or an independent contractor, you might be mad at me when I tell you this. Here's the way it works. And I think this is because of the way IRS defines you as a legal entity. The PPP loan is going to be based on your net profit as reported on your taxes. So for 2019, you're going to look at line, should be line 31. And what that shows for net profit is what the Internal Revenue Service considers as your pay. That's the number you're going to use. You're going to divide that by 12, then multiply it by 2.5. It's not uncommon for a sole proprietor. Uh, there are plenty of expenses involved with running a business that your net, your profit for the year might be, you know, a thousand dollars. If so, then I can't do that math in my head. Sorry, Tammy, I'm a music major. But a thousand divided by 12 times 2.5 is not very much money, but that's what the loan will be. It may be better than nothing. And as long as you pay it to yourself, then it's 100% forgivable, but uh, it may not be very much. Now with, by the same token, I have worked with many sole proprietors who have uh, very large net profits on their, in fact, uh, there is a limitation in PPP that it will only cover the first 100,000 of anyone's earnings. So I've talked to sole proprietors say, that doesn't even come close to covering what I pay myself. Well, congratulations is all I can say. That's a great situation to be in these days. Well, Tim, I, I wanna say thank you so much. Without any other questions, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. But we, uh, we appreciate you, your leadership, and I, I, I can just tell from the comments today, this has been incredibly informative. We will get back, uh, Tim back for uh, a future webinar as more information becomes available. Of course, the SBA district office, as he mentioned, has a host of webinars that are, are running throughout the week, and I, they'll be adding more as other things come online. So, Tim, again, thank you so much. Um, just a quick note, I want to say next week, we have our LGBTBE roundtable on the 19th. So if you're one of our certified businesses, make sure you check it, check that out and sign up. That's going to be great working statewide with the Texas LGBTQ chambers. Our first chamber networking cafe on January the 21st, new for 2021. And of course, check the chamber calendar for other events coming up. We will keep you apprised about all the information coming from the SBA district office. Our COVID-19 uh, resource pages will have information out there, including our corporate partners who are participating in round two uh, PPP that uh, are lenders. So with that, we will end it here. Thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate you. Have a good day.